Hey everyone, before we dive into today's topic, I'd like you to take a look at these four photos on the screen and tell me which of these people is the least powerful. Take a second, check out all the different activities these folks are doing. Who is the least powerful person in these photos? Well, it might surprise you, but the answer is this guy. At the end of the video, we'll come back to this and hopefully you can figure out why that is. It's not because I have a grudge against Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's a good guy. It's going to relate to some physics that we'll learn today. So on that note, what is the physics we're learning today? Well, we want to understand these three concepts, work, power, and energy. These words are used in kind of wishy-washy ways in the English language. They can mean a number of things depending on context. Work could mean a place where you go to earn money for doing a task. It could mean physical labor. It could mean doing homework. And those are all pretty different things. Power could mean how strong you are, but it could also mean how much authority you hold. And energy, well, that's the most abstract term of them all. Some people could talk about the amount of uh, enthusiasm they have for something as their energy. Uh, they could talk about someone who's a really friendly, happy person having a very positive energy about them. But those types of definitions are not very scientific. So we're going to focus on just how a physicist or scientist would define these three terms. We're going to start by talking about energy because that's really the core of all these concepts. Rather than going straight into the definition for energy, I'm going to provide an analogy, a way that you can think about energy and how it works. Imagine that you have $100 and you want to take that $100 to the store so you can spend all of your hard-earned cash on things that you need, like a puppy, which is being sold for $90, a sweet box of colored pencils for $10, or perhaps a cheeseburger for $5. So what can you buy with your $100? Well, you could get a puppy and a box of colored pencils. You could get the puppy and two cheeseburgers, and you could get all different combinations of colored pencils and cheeseburgers, but you can't buy all three of these things because the total of all three things you purchase adds up to more money than you have to spend. So you don't have enough currency to purchase all of those items. Similarly, when it comes to energy, we're gonna say things like having 500 joules of energy can get you 500 joules of work. You need to have currency in order to purchase items. Now that goes for money, very literally, but for energy, instead of talking about dollars as our currency, we're gonna talk about jewels of energy as the currency. What are you purchasing? Well, instead of physical items, you're purchasing actions, which we're gonna call work. So here's the definition for energy. Energy is officially defined by scientists as the ability to do work. Now, that's probably a pretty disappointing definition. It's not very juicy or satisfying. Um, and that's because energy is really hard to define because it exists in so many different forms. There's solar energy and thermal energy and light energy and all kinds of other types of energies that all look and feel very different. So we have to do this kind of abstract definition to cover all of those bases. So here's another thing you can think about when it comes to energy. There's a law in our universe called the law of conservation of energy, which says the following, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be changed from one form into another. Now, maybe you've learned about this in science classes before, or maybe it sounds similar because there are other laws that sound very similar to this. There's such a thing as the law of conservation of matter, which says you can't create or destroy matter. There's the law of conservation of momentum, which says that when things collide, the amount of momentum they have in total will still be the same after the collision. So specifically for energy, what does this law mean? Well, here's kind of a throwback. You might have learned already that many, many millions and billions of years ago, there were stars in our region of the universe, which lived for a certain period of time and then went supernova and exploded. And all of the energy and mass of that star, after it exploded, it spread out, cooled down, and then formed planets and new stars. And that's actually where we come from. So there's an example of old energy converting into new types of energy, but the energy didn't delete itself or in, in no new energy was added to the universe. It's all just recycling itself. And that's what the law of conservation of energy says, that you can't make new energy and you can't get rid of old energy. It's always just moving from one place to another. For our purposes, we're going to start out just by thinking about how when you take in energy, you can do work. That's the simple way we're going to think about it. So now that we've gone through energy, let's start thinking about work. What does work really mean? Again, I'm going to use an analogy rather than giving you a direct definition. Let's say that I assign my whole class a 10-page essay. Woof, 
Pretty brutal, Mr. Cowell. Now let's say that one of my students that we'll call student A writes one page of that essay every single night. And let's say student B writes two pages every single night. Well, first of all, we can assume automatically that student B is going to finish their essay first because they're completing it at twice the rate. But my question is, after 10 days, which of these two students has done the most work on their essay? Is it student A? Is it student B? Well, you might have figured this out, but it's actually the same. They have equal amounts of work that were completed after the 10 day period. Student A would have spent those 10 days completing one page per night. Student B, on the other hand, probably would have finished their essay after five days because they were doing two every night. And then as all students know, if the minimum pages you have to write is 10, it's very unlikely you're gonna write 20 pages and go extra. Um, so I think you can probably assume that if you were student B, you might stop at 10 pages. And in fact, that's what's gonna happen in this scenario. So by the end of this experience, both students have actually written a 10 page essay. They did the same task, so they did the same amount of work. And down below, you can see I'm saying WA equals WB. That's me saying the work done by student A is equal to the work done by student B. That's a mathematical statement representing what we just talked about conceptually. So now I think we're ready to define work. Work can be defined as the actions that you accomplish using energy. You need energy in order to do work. If you have no energy, you can't do work. Let's say you have a box on the floor and you need to simply push that box so that it is somewhere else in the room. So the easiest thing to do is just slide it across the floor. So let's say you put your hands on the box and you apply a forward push. And after you apply that force for a few seconds, the box is now somewhere else in the room. That box has now experienced a displacement. You have moved the box from one location to another. So there's two things at work here. You applied a force and the box was displaced as a result. Those two things can actually tell you how much work you did. Here's the formula. The work done in order to move an object is equal to how much force was being applied to that object multiplied by what was the displacement of the object. Or to put it shorter, W equals FX or work equals force times displacement. To clarify this, we should know the units. The units of work are joules, which might sound familiar because we already learned that joules is the unit of energy. It's interesting that work and energy have the same units, but it kind of makes sense because if you do 50 joules of work, that means you used 50 joules of energy. So they should have the same unit. Kind of like how if you buy a $5 cheeseburger, uh, you spend $5 on that $5 cheeseburger. So the units are dollars either way. On the right, you can see that force is still measured in newtons and X for displacement is measured in meters. So there's your formula for work. That should come in a lot of handy in this unit. Here's a more realistic example for physics students at Medfield High School. Here's a hallway and let's put our friend Mario in the hallway and let's have him walk down the hallway and then walk back. And let's have his classmate, Sonic the Hedgehog, very quickly run down the hallway and then run back. I could ask the question, which of these two did the most work? So you might think perhaps Sonic did more work or Mario did more work, but the answer is they did the same amount of work. And that's because the task that they needed to accomplish was walk down the hallway and walk back. And they both did it. They did the same thing, so they did the same amount of work. So you could say W Mario equals W Sonic. The work done by Mario equals the work done by Sonic. But there's clearly a difference here. If Sonic the Hedgehog is going really, really fast and Mario comparatively is going pretty slow, then there must be something physically different about the two that we can quantify or turn into a number and identify. So what's different? Well, the difference is the amount of time that it took each of them to accomplish this work. So there's one more concept we're gonna throw in here called power. Power is the amount of work that you can do in a certain amount of time. It's the rate at which you can accomplish a task. So let's imagine that we have someone pushing a cart and we measure how much time it takes them to push that cart across the room or down a shopping aisle or something. We can calculate how much power is in that person's body, how much power they're using during that action by taking into account those two things, how much work they did and how much time it took them to accomplish that task of pushing the cart. So you could say power equals work divided by time, or you could say P equals W divided by T, and that's the more convenient way of writing it, of course. Now, once again, you need to know the units of these things. Power is measured in watts. 
Work is measured in joules, as we already learned, and time, of course, is measured in seconds. Now, one of these new things might seem a little bit familiar. Power being measured in watts is something you've actually seen before in your everyday experiences. If you've ever changed a light bulb before, you might have noticed that they have things like 50 watts or 100 watts written on the top of the bulb. If you've ever been curious what that actually means, it means that those light bulbs are using that amount of joules of energy in order to power the light bulb every one second. So a 50 watt bulb uses 50 joules of energy per second and a 100 watt bulb, which is brighter, and here's why, is something that's using 100 joules every one second. So calculation wise, power is just the rate at which you do work. So if you're doing more work in the same amount of time, you're more powerful. So let's do two practice problems really quick, just to make sure we know how to use these formulas. Question A, if a man pushed a shopping cart a distance of 100 meters while using a constant force of 50 newtons, then how many joules of work did he do? In order to answer a physics question, I always like to start by drawing a diagram. And since I'm doing this electronically, it's really fast for me. Here's the guy pushing the cart. You can see that he does a displacement of 100 meters to that cart. He moves it that far. And all the while, he's using 50 newtons of force to push. I can identify from the question that they're asking me how much work is being done. And I can identify that work is the variable W. So I'm going to choose a formula uh, and a set of variables that include work. Now, either of the two formulas above would do, but I can see from the wording that I'm being given newtons, which is a force, and 100 meters, uh, which is a displacement. So I'm going to choose that first formula, and I'm going to first list out my knowns and my unknowns. I don't know how much work the guy did. And in fact, that's what they're asking me in the question. I do know that the force he uses is 50 newtons. And I know that the displacement of the cart that he pushes is a total of 100 meters. So I can calculate very quickly what the work done is. It's the force of 50 times the displacement of 100, which gives us 5,000 joules of work that he did. There's my answer. That wasn't too hard. Let's look at question B. If that same man took 25 seconds to push the cart, then how many watts of power was he using while he was pushing the cart? So they say if that same man, and this is part B, so we don't have to draw a new diagram. This is the exact same scenario happening. But I will note that they give us time information. So we're able to reuse some of the information from the previous example, but we're going to throw in time being equal to 25 seconds. And I'm listing, since I know it now, that work is equal to 5,000 joules. So how much power was he using while this was happening? Well, we have a formula that says power equals work divided by time. In part A, I already solved for the fact that the work that he did was 5,000 joules. And the amount of time that it took him to do that work, in part B, it says that was 25 seconds. So 5,000 joules of work divided by 25 seconds of time, that gives you 200 watts of power. Now, if he had completed this task faster, maybe he started to do kind of a run to get his grocery shopping done very quickly, uh, he could have cut down on the time it took him and that would have actually increased our answer. So he could choose what power level he wants based on how much time it's taking him to complete certain tasks. So it's important to note is that 200 watts isn't the power of this guy in the problem. He could be any power level he wants depending on how quickly he moves. So there's our last practice problem for the day. And now I'm gonna bring it back at the end to this question that we saw at the beginning of the video. So can you figure out why Arnold is the least powerful out of everyone in these pictures? Let's take a look at what each of them is doing. The guy pushing the cart is applying a forward force. And as a result, he's making the cart move. The girl on the steps is applying a force downward, which lifts her body upward against the force of gravity. Uh, the lacrosse players are moving their own bodies and their sticks and the ball and their helmets and equipment and everything. What is Arnold moving? He's actually not moving very much. He might be kind of flexing his muscles, but he isn't actually transporting anything anywhere. So he actually doesn't have any displacement to put into the work formula to put into the power formula. No displacement means no work is done, which means there is no power. So his power is currently zero watts. If he were to pick something up, he might be very powerful. But as of the moment this photo was snapped, no power at all. So I hope that was helpful and I'll see you in the next video.